to Portland, Oregon. My pleasure. It's good to be back. Uh, yes, be back. Okay, that's yes. my next question. Have yes. you been here before? I have definitely been to Portland. Um, I came first as a commissioner uh, at, in South Carolina on the South Carolina Public Service Commission. I think I've been here two times in that capacity. It's a beautiful city, a very walkable city. I had some great fish here at one point. And uh, it's, uh, I just love it. It's a, there's a lot of energy. I don't know if I would relocate. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but I'm just such an East Coast girl. You know, you just kind of wire three ways, right? Either middle, or one of the coasts. Well, I didn't get the memo because I started in Ohio. Uh, yes. Moved to Los Angeles. So I lived in Ohio for 22 years. Right. Los Angeles, 11 years. Virginia for uh, eight years. Dallas for five years, and now here for nine. Well, years. you're an anomaly. You so know, I've most people. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, most people don't move much. Yeah. Uh, you know, most people stay close to home and family, and and that's the reason why the issues that we speak about net neutrality, uh, radio, television, uh, media, diversity, consolidation, all of those issues are so important because people are very wedded to the communities and they want to know what is going on there, what platforms are best uh, for them to, to use uh, and to rely on to do that. And to me, uh, you know, I, I, I love broadcast. I really do. I have a love, more of a love for radio, I must admit, because I don't have to dress up and, and, and look a certain way, so there's less pressure. It, you know, to me, it's just, just more organic. But I'd have this respect, and, and I'm addicted, uh, unapologetically addicted, uh, to broadcast uh, the platform. It informs and it entertains. It takes me to a place I would not organically go, and I find it uh, very satisfying for me. Well, it's really interesting that I get to talk to you post FCC yes. because what what I know about you as you know a citizen and someone who's you know represented our interests and as a you know a person who's you know been fascinated by where people came from before they come to that place where they're on a national level. It's really cool that you're a multimedia person because you have you're rooted in print, you're re you're rooted in, in broadcast. And you were able to sort of bring all of those multiple disciplines together. Can you talk about how the multiple disciplines were a part of your past and how you wove them into your, your career, your very public career? One of the greatest gifts I ever received was the opportunity to serve at the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC. Uh, back in, I got a call in 2000, the summer of 2009, and I thought, you couldn't tell me I didn't jump as high as Michael Jordan uh, when I got that call. It's, are you willing, would you like to serve on the FCC? To be honest with you, I thought I was going to get a call for the Federal, Federal Energy Commission, but the FCC turned out to be this tremendous blessing, and we say blessing in the South, um, you know, because it allowed me to grow and expand and bring my interest uh, that um, I experienced in Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina. I, I remember listening to a radio being uh, informed uh, and entertained uh, in music, uh, through music, which my parents hated. Uh, and there was always this tug of war with the radio station, you know, when they weren't home, you know, because we were all latchkey children at that point. I played what I wanted and then I sneaked it back to the, um, the, the more mature uh, stations. Um, my parents spent, especially Sundays, you know, reading the newspapers and, and pouring through what was going on, uh, you know, that day and, and trying to encourage me to read it. No, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. I grabbed the comics first uh, and mostly. Um, but through them, through those interactions, I really uh, got a feel for what's going on, uh, what was going on in the world. Um, and again, television news was a family, um, you know, gathering because it was a very traditional uh, by way of focus. You know, we got home at a certain hour and we got a chance to to to, to dine. Sometimes uh, it wasn't as strict as as the older we got, it wasn't as strict that we had to um, not sit in front of the television. So. Uh, you know, during those times were important because, again, that is how I got my uh, critical news and uh, information. And so when I got the call, particularly during a time uh, during a time when broadband enabled infrastructures are really transforming the way we give and receive information, I just couldn't think of a better gift uh, because it allowed me uh, to take what I experienced uh, back in South Carolina. Uh, in the rural state, a relatively rural, relatively not 
so affluent state and say these are the types of platforms that we need to, uh, to, to find out what's going on, to build our communities, uh, to display and to share our talents uh, you know, with the rest of the world. And broadband enable platforms and, and the media and how things are transformed and, and projected. That truly allows us to do that. Consolidation has changed a lot of how information is gleaned and shared and you know do you have any current musings about those changes and the impact that it's having on our community so one of the biggest challenges when it comes to localism when it comes to you know getting information that is acutely relevant to you and your communities is this just increased um, pace by way of media consolidation. You know, on the one hand, I'm a capitalist. I, you know, I, I believe um, in um, you know communities being able to thrive and and, and uh, entities being able to to make money. I have no problem with that. I love to be on that side of the ledger uh, one day. But the downside, and everything has a downside, is when you have uh, this e more e uh, consolidated ecosystem. Uh, while it may bring more efficiencies. What you lose oftentimes is what made that station gr the greatest, uh, the ability to connect with members of the community, uh, to inform the community directly. Things have become more nationalized um, and, and less localized. And uh, the, the, the talents that we have, you know, you know sometimes in radio, um, you know, that person's not even anywhere near you. Right. And so when you think about that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, whatever's going on in New York is not going to help me when my kid is at the bus stop. And so what and how, when it comes to serving the communities, you know, that's part of the challenge and the downside of, of consolidation. Economic efficiencies all day long. Personal effectiveness, there's, there's a challenge. So you talked about that earlier, your efficiency and effectiveness. It's you a know, Schadenfreude there. It's a I, 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 you know, when you talk about policy and the way things are evolving uh, in this nation and around the world, the most effective forms of governance uh, is very narrow, singular. Um, you know, you know, sometimes authoritarian, and I, and I'm not taking any political side right now. I'm just affirming that the most efficient structures are the ones that are narrow, that you might rely just on one or two, uh, maybe two or three voices uh, to make or to get at a decision. But the most effective forms of interaction, of governance, um, are inclusive. Uh, they get out of their comfort zones and, and speak to communities, address their needs and craft policy based on all of those interactions. And so um, I, there's a, a constant tug uh, with us, friction uh, between efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, and to me, that goes back to whether or not as a policymaker, regulator, elected official, whether or not your goal is to meet your community's needs or to get something executed. To get it executed, you don't need a lot of interaction but get things done that will benefit communities, that requires a community's input. And really, it's about impact. We need a, a government to help make sure that the impact of programs and decisions can be positive and productive with the communities that they are elected to representatively serve, right? So the question we have to ask ourselves as individuals, uh, as media owners and operators, uh, you know, as, as policymakers or lawmakers, is are we here to serve? Are we here to serve? Are we here or part of a movement to make our communities uh, better, uh, to allow uh, those, um, even the, the most economically, uh, culturally challenged hamlets, do they have the tools they need uh, to, to, to thrive uh, and, and to survive. And if we cannot answer that question with very targeted policies and, um, and opportunities and decisions. 
then we, our legacy is going to be less than. And so, you know, for me, it's not about how I see the world. It is how the world is and how we as, uh, you know, individuals can uh, put forth uh, messages and, and, uh, and, and decisions uh, that will allow that to change if there's a problem or to be channeled out to the world if it's something to, to be uh, proud of. And uh, these platforms, media platforms, allow for both things to happen. They often allow us or really force us to look at ourselves uh, for what we truly are. And if we're satisfied with it, then wonderful. If we're not, uh, we should not double down on that. We should do the types of things uh, uh, to, to make things uh, better. And we should broadcast that too the evolution of it. We should, we should broadcast and project um, the, um, our quest to get there. Because oftentimes, particularly when people of a certain younger age, we think how it is, um, it, it just hatched. Um, uh, you know, this didn't just happen, you know, when you got here or when you, uh, you know, a lot of these movements, while I respect them, sometimes we need to do our homework because your movement was not the first. It might be the first in terms of being worded or, um, or with that particular focus, but it's certainly not the, folks, uh, the first in terms of the concept and the idea and des desires to, uh, for, uh, to address a certain need. Uh, you're not the first, and you are often not the, um, the one that has done it better. And so we all benefit, meaning the persons who might have been the first um, or the second, and those who are, um, you know, really looking at our communities to, to move and to, uh, and, and, and to uh, create, um, you know, more opportunities and, and bring points of views across. Um, you know, we need to learn from each other and we all benefit when that happens. Yeah. And, and being narrow definitely prevents the cross-pollination of new ideas. Look, if you're in a silo, you're going to conduct yourself in a silo and you will for, forever see yourself through that very myopic lens. I don't know who benefits other than you, um, you know, when that happens. And so if you're about change and educating and informing and, and projecting different points of view, then a multifocal lens is definitely what's needed. Does the FCC care about local communities? I am not going to say um, that the people that are uh, serving on the FCC today, that they don't care about uh, communities. I will say uh, that uh, the way in which they go about it, um, I don't think it always hits the mark. I, I, I really don't because, again, if you do not put communities and people first, um, if the primary messenger uh, for you as, as big business or industry, then the individual needs of communities will not be properly addressed. And so again, it goes back to whether you want to be efficient or effective. Efficient is just li listening to industry alone. Effective is listening to communities along with those industries and trying to figure out what we need to craft in order to build um, ecosystems that will benefit both. There are ways for us to walk and chew gum at the same time. And, and um, uh, we, we do it, when we do it most often, that flavor is just lovely. Uh, do you, now that you're on the other side of being a commissioner, is there anything looking back that you wish you would have had an opportunity to spend more time on and that you hope could possibly go onto an agenda in the future? One of my biggest regrets is, and this was due to politics, is we didn't do a, what we call a critical information needs a study at the FCC. What that prevented was the FCC truly looking at whether or not there are issues and harms and bottlenecks in, in, in the media, um, you know, an ecosystem or ecology um, that are preventing uh, innovative and, and, and entrepreneurial players, uh, you know, in the mix that um, there are more uh, are there ways or the things that are standing in the way of more ownership opportunities? We cannot make wholesale changes that might be targeted to certain individuals or groups um, because of certain um, critical court decisions um, if we don't have the data needed to rely on. We don't have the data needed to rely on. And um, as a result, we are either moved by politics 
or, or, or personalities. And um, I personally do not think that that gives us the best policy uh, for the um, you know overall environment, particularly when it comes to competition uh, and, and, and you know, more players in the market and more opportunities. I don't think that gets us there. And um, that, um, to me, if I have any regrets, which I have few, that's the top two on the list. What was it like when you were chairman briefly, or chairperson? What was it like for you? One of the things that um, I think about in retrospect um, I had about five and a half months to uh, chair the FCC was the doubt that so many people had about my abilities. Uh, you know, I, I was the first African-American female. Uh, I was the first female uh, to ever uh, lead. And people had, because of their preconceived notions, um, certain expectations that I would strictly uh, be this uh, caretaker, um, uh, and um, and I was not. Um, so I used every day. Um, I looked at everything in two week cycles. Uh, that um, you know, I've got two weeks to get this done, and we cleared. If you compare more dockets, um, you know, more things under that five and a half months than, than my uh, predecessor in the equivalent amount of time. Uh, we were not going to be a caretaker. We were going to get things done. Um, we were going to do a, a lot of major minor things, not the biggest things. We knew we weren't going to do that. But things that had been languishing, we said we would get it out of the way. Well, you know, that's what people are getting paid a lot of money to do now called agile or, <laughs> you know, being a scrum master. You know, so I think you may have in your in your in your pre-retirement, you might have some you might have some skills that people would would pay you a lot of money for because you know it's it's about getting things done and you know I, my my mother is uh, from South Carolina oh really so, yeah uh, from Donald's South Carolina outside of Ware Shoals oh. Hodges Greenwood oh you know, yeah all those big, yeah know. exactly <laughs> right right yeah so I remember that area and if I know anything about folks from South Carolina. Don't think that they're just going to be caretakers. They're going to get something done. Yes, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, people, when you don't fit a first, when you don't fit a particular profile, particularly in a city uh, like Washington D.C., um, you know, people figure they have you pegged. What we we did not go out of our way to do this because it was organic. But what we were very intentional about doing was showing people how wrong they are about uh, people from certain places uh, with certain backgrounds that uh, we uh, have done and have the ability to leave, lead and serve. Um, and uh, we did that, I believe, with distinction. And people are still talking about it, even though that's been years ago. Well, one of the highlights of that time, you as uh, um, chair and your colleague Michael Copps, you all were just lauded for being committed to public hearings on important matters before the FCC, and you spent many hours listening to the public, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, does it seem like that practice has stopped? Is it permanent? Is it just a cyclical thing? Can it come back? One of the things that I learned from my uh, background and, and my family's background is the best way to do something well is to be inclusive. And so one of the things that um, I, I did on a regular basis was get outside of the Beltway, get outside of Washington, D.C., and go to the communities to talk about broadband, to talk about, uh, you know, the media, uh, media consolidation and other issues, to talk about inmate calling issues, which is a devastating, um, you know, practice uh, of people being unjustly charged, unreasonably charged in our communities, and it's causing families to fall apart, going further into bankruptcy. Uh, those issues are front and center for uh, individuals uh, in, in these communities. But if you stay inside of your D.C. silo, you'll never hear or see them, and they will never make it to the top of your priority cycle. And so what getting outside of the Beltway did for me was to hear and see what people needed and thought. Um, and that helped shape um, my five and a half months as uh, chair of the FCC. And every single day of those almost nine years I served on the FCC, it's not what I want or what I think. It's what the people need and what they uh, say to me. That's what counts. And good policy derives or they, it comes from that. I venture to guess that if I had access to your public calendar at that time, 
it would show that you were not only outside the beltway, but you were in some corn country and soybean country and hog country that you were probably spending as much time in urban with urban constituencies as you were rural. And um, is that a, is that an accurate assumption on my part? We went outside of our comfort zone every single time we went to a place. What we would do is if we went to a conference, we try to leverage other trips. Uh, and when we saw opportunities elsewhere, we uh, went to communities like Marietta, Ohio, which incidentally I had nothing in common with necessarily. But to hear from, uh, you know, that young 16-year-old who lives, uh, you know, in that valley and they, she doesn't have broadband, what her needs are. We hung out on Skid Row, which I am here to affirm to you is no picnic. And we talked to this young lady named Frenchie who had seen I Know Better Days, um, who was currently a house, but you can tell um, had a, a lifetime of experiences. What she told me that at her lowest point, the only address she had was an email address. When she said that to me, that reinforced how much connectivity means at any time in your life. And so while you hear me being passionate about bringing broadband to uh, communities, large and small, providing media and other uh, opportunities, technological opportunities, communities large and small, because I know it can make a difference in someone's life when they're at the peak uh, of their, uh, you know, evolutionary and economic cycle, but more importantly, when they feel and maybe at their worst, it is uplifting and enabling and inclusive. And that's why good policy making um, and seeing those images, that's why it's so important for anybody making a decision in this country. So when they're making decisions, and we're in this high tech country now, with you know, granted, a lot of our fellow citizens cannot access easily. And then we have these amazing novel things like public comment systems in general, which has been sort of wrought with issues at the yeah. FCC. Is, you know, is all that stuff just going into like a cyber pit or is it, can it be helpful? Can it be fixed? Can it be reformed? Regardless of the technology, the platform, the means of receiving and sending information. The key is what you do with it. The key is how seriously you take it. The difference between good policy and very narrow, not as effective policy, is that you do not take the totality of what you read and mind meld and mesh that into um, you know, a decision making matrix. And, and so to me, um, there have been some issues, as you know, uh, with our online, um, with the FCC's online comment cycle. There have been some you know, issues about you know, what um, weight certain comments have uh, you know, received. But again, if you don't look at the community's needs, what individuals are asking for, uh, and what you can do as a regulator in this case uh, to provide and enable that, then you're just collecting a paycheck and, and, and uh, uh, being, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and just giving great speeches. Um, I being, wanted- Being efficient, not effective. It, being efficient, not effective. I wanted to be able to walk out the door when I made the announcement to leave that I did everything I could to be a voice for the least of these. That um, I was the voice for the voiceless. Because there are millions, tens of millions of voiceless individuals when it comes to, uh, gov when it comes to government listening um, uh, you know, in uh, this country. And uh, I just re went out of my way um, to every time I picked up a people, piece of paper to make a decision, every time there was a docket before me, what do people need? What have I heard? How can this make uh, this community, um, you know, particularly where we, where we are right now, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in, in Portland, which is, uh, cranes are everywhere, but not everybody is working as a result of those cranes being up there. You know, you've got, you know, opportunities seem to be abound, you know, where we sit. 
but not everybody is benefiting. And so um, it is as important for you to fuel those cranes and, and what that needs, but to provide opportunities uh, where a crane will probably never see itself uh, in those communities. And if you don't do both, um, you're not serving your community completely. Well, the cranes are an awesome site. And one just went up out where we are in Gresham, which is mm -hmm. the city next door where we're based. And to see a crane in Gresham was like surreal. Right. But when I pass these cranes, I leave Portland and go to Gresham every day. I get stuck crossing the river and merging onto from the five onto I-84. And the homeless camp has gotten right. bigger and bigger. And yes. the first time I ever saw people living under bridges and freeways was nearly 30 years ago in Brazil. Yes. To see that here in the United States and to look down from those cranes and see the least of us there and that these encampments are growing and growing and growing. I mean, I know this has nothing to do with telecommunications, but it kind of has something to do with localism and being our sisters and brothers keepers. Right. You know, how does that impact you on the level of being a policy maker and, a, and a, an influencer? While I no longer have a vote at the FCC, I still have a voice and I intend to use it. I intend to use it to look at these chronic digital and opportunity divides in our uh, communities and say we can do better. Uh, leveraging technology with good policy, with targeted spending, we can do better to get rid of these 30 and 40 and 50 year issues uh, that have been plaguing our communities. This is the greatest nation in the world. I know there might be 200 other com countries that might uh, counter me, but to me this is the greatest nation in the world. We have seen billionaires uh, being made in less than 10 years. You know, with Silicon, Ville, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, now Silicon Hill, now we're talking about you know, Silicon Harlem and other opportunities. I've seen billionaires uh, that are barely 35 years old. You cannot tell me in a country where that can happen that we cannot address these chronic divides um, and chronic poverty uh, and, and, and just systemic um, just helplessness and homelessness in this country. You can't tell me we can't solve that. And so, um, you know, that um, is uh, how and why. Um, even though I am no longer at the FCC, that I continue to speak up on these issues. I continue to talk about broadband and, and technology and uh, digital inclusion and, and opportunities because I know uh, that for somebody who might be hopeless today, that that can be provide a platform, a bridge, uh, a, a way uh, for them to get information uh, uh, that they critically need for tomorrow. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. The FCC is putting forward a further notice of proposed rulemaking on cable franchising that could completely defund local government or force them to choose between franchise fees for lo and local community channels. This seems to violate the letter and spirit of the Cable Act. Should the FCC stop proceeding? Well, when it comes to uh, the particular further notice, when you know looking at uh, what counts in that five percent uh, cable franchise fees, I think all of us need to look at that closely, about what that means uh, when it comes to serving communities, about what that need means for um, you know particularly with you know public access uh, you know channels, uh, you know do they have the tools and the means to inform communities? Because the one good thing about PEG and other um, uh, you know, non-commercial commercial, um, uh, you know, media outlets is that it has the ability and the dexterity to be a reflection uh, and a pulse of the community. And um, anything that would uh, uh, threaten that uh, needs to be looked at one, two, or three times. And so uh, it is a further notice. It is an opportunity for the community, everybody, to weigh in if uh, they feel that uh, what is counting in that 5% is going against the interests of the, the community. Uh, so um, I know, you know some people uh, don't think it's their place um, you know, to weigh in when it comes to um, these uh, critical notices, but this could actually change uh, the, what you see and what you hear um, over the air. So if these things are important to you, you need to pay attention to agencies like the FCC that could 
critically change the way you use and consume uh, uh, these um, you know, media outlets uh, and um, you know, other technologies. Is there any call to action you feel comfortable saying on camera to me, to the camera, to our supporters, our producers, our people in PEG? Is there, you know, is there a through line? You're, you're, you come from a, you know, a background of strong, committed community service, um, both from a business perspective and from a political perspective. And you you see you see this you see the the issue that's before us from like probably a three hundred and sixty degree perspective that many of us may not see. Is there any call to action you feel comfortable sharing with us? If, you know, I, I, I'm coming to the mm -hmm. I'm coming to the to mm -hmm. the to the mount, and I'm seeking some some solace from an oracle from someone who really <laughs> knows a lot to keep the wind in my sails right. as I lead my organization of 20 people and the you know three or four hundred volunteers that we mm -hmm. serve and the communities that we serve what could you share with us and you know people like me both in leadership and at peg stations what 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 could you share with us that you feel comfortable saying on camera to be mindful of and to be taking action on the one thing that um, I've seen uh, since um, I've been a part of this regulatory space and it's been almost tw 20 years. The one thing that I see that is very interesting, exciting but challenging, is that we are living in an ever-converged world. And when you have agencies like the Federal Communications Commission, which to me is at the epicenter when it comes to technology and, 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 and telecommunications, because that is what drives everything we do, you know, you know everything that um, is a, a part of um, our day-to-day -day lives. It drives everything. What they do every month when they have a meeting, what is on their agenda is, is something of import to you. If I were you, I would look at what is about to be announced, what is pending on their uh, agenda as often as I can, because they are making, five people are making critical judgments, critical decisions on things that affect every aspect of your life. How you interact with your internet service provider, you know, what types of things or, or stations that, uh, you know, who owns the stations and, you know, what will be on TV, not content, but the owners drive the content. The executive, you know, the, 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 those executives there, uh, they make a decision on the, you know, the content. And so when you talk about radio, telecommunications, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to wireless, particularly with programs that are designed to help those um, that are most in need, the FCC is making decisions every single day, once a month, either voting to consider them or voting to change uh, them. Uh, so if you're not watching, listening, and participating, decisions will be made without you. Silence in action, is, that's, those aren't your friends uh, when it comes to um, how you interact, um, you know, how uh, you will be interacted by or with. Um, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, again, critical pl platforms. So the, the FCC is a, one of the most important agencies a lot of people don't think about unless there's a wardrobe malfunction during the Super Bowl and then everybody has figured out or somebody says a bad four or five or six letter words, you know, over the air, then everybody figures out what the FCC. Not just on Super Bowl Sunday, not just when someone, um, you know, says, a, you know, a bad word or, word or something um, of over on online, should you pay attention? or reach out to the FCC. Every single day, every single month in particular, you need to follow because they're making critical decisions that can either make your life better or more challenging. Now, peeling it back a little bit, wasn't localism theoretically one of the tenets of the founding of the FCC? I mean, is it still something that you think is valued? I mean, again, I know you're speaking for yourself. Yes not as a member of the commission, but it, it seems like the thinking is it costs money to invest locally, economies of scale happen better when there's media consolidation, you know, 
does that mean that there's a you know an implicit bias now against localism media policy in the USA? I will say that you can become as big and consolidated um, as the laws will allow, as regulations will allow. That does not mean you should not serve your local communities. Does that, that does not mean that you do not hire local talent or focus on local issues. They're not mutually exclusive. And the day that we allow them to come mutual, become mutually exclusive is the day that they become irrelevant to our communities. Uh, so again, the only way to change that, to short circuit that, is to speak up about that. Those of us that are working in communities, like I have five jurisdictions. So I have four mayors and one county council, the Multnomah County Commission, mm -hmm. five incredible women, uh, four mayors and their councils. And I, you know, I'm also a, 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 a politician from South Carolina's son. My mother okay. was in Ohio. Got it. I am in these people's faces saying thank you, giving them reports of impact, mm -hmm. and also requesting funds and support. And one of our commissioners here said, oh, Marty gets it. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid that some of my fellow people that have been um, spoiled by mailbox money coming from franchise fees may be in a little Rip Van Winkle right now. Can you, is there anything you can say to kind of rattle the, the <laughs> bedpost and say, hey, wake up? You know, kind of like, you know, Lawrence Fishburne at the end of school days or something. Is there a, is there a, a wake up call that you can say to people? One of the big things that I see, particularly when it comes to the net neutrality the debate, uh, those who were pro-repeal of net neutrality principles or rules, is that this was a solution in search of the problem, of a problem, that um, things are working well, why do we need rules? We have to sometimes remind people of history. The net neutrality rules that were repealed in December didn't just hatch. They didn't just come about. Um, they were crafted um, from years, decades of, of, of decision making, of seeing that there were imperfections in the market, uh, that uh, there were incumbents uh, that were using um, their um, you know, a, a, a ability and their strength to block uh, certain innovators uh, and, and, and persons who were trying to get access. The minute we forget how we got here, the successes that we have been realized is the day we put them in jeopardy. And so we cannot say, oh wow, things are just going great. We don't have a need to do this. Or, um, uh, you know, there is, uh, we, uh, this is it worked this way for so long, we don't have a need to do something different. You've got a different generation of people. You've got, uh, you know, persons who are, you know, aging and consume these resources differently. When you fail to reinvent yourself politically from a regulatory uh, point of view and as an individual, is the day you not become stagnant, because some of us can deal with stagnation. Um, the, 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 that's the day in which you will wake up one morning and see a preventable decline. So we can never rest um, you know, when it comes to these technologies, when it comes to these platforms, we can never rest. Um, we've got to reinvent ourselves. We've got to challenge ourselves and reassess what the needs of the communities are and how we use these current platforms uh, to, uh, to address new uh, challenges. Um, the minute we stop doing that is the minute we see our communities uh, decline. And, uh, uh, you know, for in, in, anybody who's not in the business of reinventing themselves, they need a new profession. <laughs> I, yeah, that, that's the truth. You talk about Frenchie who only had one address. I mean, yes. that gave me goosebumps to yeah. hear that. Yeah. And when I think about the potential for all of our community channels, our community radio, grassroots radio, internet, television, I think about the increased opportunities for people of color yes. in the media. And, and again, going into our little area here, we put a pop-up, a digital inclusion mm. pop-up in a community that is the most diverse zip code in the state of Oregon. Right. 88 languages. They now wow. changed it to 100 wow. this school year. Right. 100 languages are spoken in the homes of elementary school age mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. in this zip code in Gresham, Oregon. 100 languages. Wow. 
And what we're trying to do is augment what the schools are doing, what the parents are doing, but what opportunities are you seeing? And, and I know that you were talking about also how policy and good policy mm -hmm. is keeping economic opportunities right. available. What, what message could I share from this interview with those young uh, brown and black beautiful boys and girls that um, you know are living in one of the poorest yet most richly diverse um, zip codes in our state? One of the things that I see uh, every time I travel is what the internet has done for each individual. The one thing that excites me about being connected uh, to the internet about broadband is that it meets you where you are. It is not judgmental. It doesn't look at you and say you live on this side of the track, or you wear your hair this way, or or, or, or you just you know um, you know you, you speak bro broken English, um, or you uh, got a disability. It's not judgmental. It meets you and what it provides access to is information, opportunities, and the ability for you to retool and channel yourself in a way that will make you successful. And that says success is defined by you, not by me, you know, not by his dollar signs, but what you need uh, to move to your next level to be your best person. For us not, not to go out of our way to provide those opportunities to those communities um, is short-sighted in its regulatory malpractice. It, it just is. Well, it sounds like bad business, too. I mean, McKinsey, the big international That's, global mm -hmm. consulting firm, did a study. We all like quants and you know, <laughs> yes. stats. And they said that the most profitable companies in the world had the most diverse C-suite and board of directors. Look, the stats are very clear that the persons with the best business ledgers, you know, E you know, economic returns are in, uh, on investment are the most diverse. Sadly, not everybody's getting the memo. And so until they get the memo, what connectivity allows is for us to create, create our own, uh, to be uh, you know, entrepreneurs. I remember when, when I was coming up, uh, it was like, you need to get a job. Now, you create your own jobs, and it's easier to do that. You know, the internet provides you the ability, and I have a storefront, so you don't have to pay that rent. Um, the internet uh, provides you an opportunity to, to have the voice. You don't have to worry about a gatekeeper, um, you know, you know uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that programmer on, on that channel or, or that station. You don't need them. You've got the opportunity to reach billions of people uh, if, if you have the ability to be connected if you have uh, you know, a, a, a mobile broadband or a fixed broadband connection, you have the opportunity to be you, you know, to do what you need um, uh, to, to, to improve your own future. That power literally is in your hands if you have the proper type of plan uh, in, in, in order to afford that. So it's up to regulators to make sure you have the proper type of plan uh, to, to be able to move to the next level. Opportunities are abound, and no matter who you are, I've been in the most challenged part of the developing world, and I've seen those cell phones in hand, and I've seen people um, with the biggest smiles on their faces because now they can connect with individuals. Now, you know, they can keep in touch with their families. They can call for help, and they can be the entrepreneurs that their natural talents um, you know, allow themselves to, and they can ship to market. They don't have to have a middleman that takes the bulk of their profits away. They can do, deal directly with the end user. Whatever and whoever your end user is, no matter who you are or where you live, connectivity will allow you to get there. There is a way for you to be informed and educated um, and to be more proficient uh, with, with the tools you have online. It is up to us as policymakers to get you connected, but no matter who you are, where you are, how much you don't have, you've got the opportunity to be better over a platform that 
is the most democratizing one I have ever seen in my entire life. Use it and challenge those like me who are decision makers to make sure you will always be able to use it.